Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Nobusha Shongwa. I'm the Dean and the Head of the School of Arts here at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and I'm going to be your program director this afternoon. Um, we don't usually like to start by apologizing, but like when the apology is required, we need to do the apology. We do want to apologize first by starting our program late. Um, it's not something that like we usually do um, as we are uh, during the Poetry Africa Festival. So we try by all means that we start on time uh, because like we do have our team um, that is doing our live streaming. So they are always on time uh, to make sure that like as we begin the program, um, they are here uh, with us. So um, I do want to start by welcoming you, but the person who's gonna do the official welcome on behalf of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, I'm gonna call him um, shortly. Um, I do want uh, to thank you very much uh, for uh, coming and joining uh, as we celebrate um, Professor Mazisi Gunene as the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, as part and parcel of our Poetry uh, Africa Festival. Um, I must say that uh, we began the Poetry Africa Festival, which is our 26th edition this year, um, at the University of Johannesburg. For the first time, we have partnered uh, with the University of Johannesburg, um, and uh, I'm happy that uh, our curators of the Poetry Africa Festival, uh, Mrs. Pindile Shongwa, uh, Kwa's Roots, as well as uh, Karen Ijumba, worked together uh, to bring the program that we have, uh, which started uh, on the 6th uh, of October in Johannesburg, and we will be finishing everything on Sunday. But this afternoon, um, this is an important day uh, as uh, University of KwaZulu-Natal as we celebrate um, our first Africa laureate, that is Professor Mazesi Um So as, uh, as we celebrate him, I would like to start uh, our program by inviting um, our Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, for the College of Humanities, Professor Ntlantlam Kize, who is going to do the official welcome on behalf of the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Professor Mkize, over to you. A big round of applause for Prof. Mkize. Program Director, Professor Shlongwa, our guest speaker, Professor Zodwa Moza Madigani, Mrs. Kunene and the Kunene family, as well as the Mazisi Kunene Foundation, staff and students, ladies and gentlemen. It is my singular honor to welcome you to the second Mazisi Kunene Memorial Lecture. The inaugural lecture having been delivered by Dr. Maulana Karenga in 2019. Unfortunately, and largely due to the COVID-19 pandemic of the past two years, our efforts to host the Memorial Lecture in 2020 and 2021 when compromised. We are delighted that the memorial lecture has been resumed in 2022. The poet laureate of Africa, Professor Mazisi Raymond Mungoni Gunene, is one of the most distinguished and decorated scholars to have been produced by the African continent. Starting his career at a tender age, by the time he was 11 years old, meaning by the time he was still younger than some of the learners sitting at the back of this audience, he had already published a number of poems in newspapers and magazines. His thoughts, which are expressed in poetic and magnificent Isizulu, are a testimony to the long-established African tradition of the Baat or Imbongi, whose responsibility is not only to preserve the history of a nation, but also to speak truth to power 
ensuring that the checks and balances are in place, that those in authority are called to task when they deviate from the mandate to establish and maintain a just society. Kunene's work has relevance beyond African literature and history. Through his interdisciplinary scholarship, he succeeded in articulating African philosophy, worldview, and psychology, and international relations. Kunene's work resonates well with the vision and mission of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, which is to be a prima university of African scholarships. Key to this vision is the development and advancement of African languages as languages of intellectual engagement, as languages of science, as languages of basic and higher education, political and social discourse, languages of the economy, as well as the social media. In this regard, those who are in authority, including our leaders nationally, and institutions of higher learning should lead by example in the same way that Kunene did. Universities such as ours need to entrench the speaking of African languages and normalize it. The University of KwaZulu-Natal has introduced Kiswahili. A delegation has just returned from the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and we are collaborating with the Kiswahili Institute. I do pray that one day, one of Baba Kunene's uh, greatest achievements, Emperor Shaga the Great, will be translated into Kiswahili as well, as well as other languages that are spoken on the African continent. And in this regard, I am pleased to announce that we are working together with the UKZN Press to pursue some of these engagements. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm also pleased to announce that here at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, we are continuing in collaboration with the Mazisi Kunene Foundation to appoint a chair who will advance the scholarly work of Mazisi Kunene. We are hoping that by this time next year, the chair will have been appointed, that he or she will be surrounded by masters, doctoral and postdoctoral students. The sole intention or objective being to advance the scholarly work of Baba Mazisi Kunene. A lot of his manuscripts still need to be uh, translated. A lot of his uh, manuscripts still need to be preserved, preserved for future generations. And to this task, we are as staunchly committed as we were in the past five years. Thank you for uh, 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 who worked very much with the work on the works of King Shaga, Manina Manenagazi, Galoma Kamamba, Lagenzo, Kabonga Kutin Fide. I hope that you will enjoy today's deliberations. I thank you. Aspende simupe ishombe futi ukabazela. E, usesam gelege manje. Umutumangabe esam geli wege wea yenzenjan. Akumuli panji. E, atugu ukuzelu la. Relax and feel at home because you've been told that you are welcome. Thank you very much, Prof. Mkiza. We are now relaxed and we feel at home. Now that we are feeling at home, I can also start. Even my, the tone of my voice is going to change. Now I'm, I can say, aye, Lucy, hi, aye, aye. I can't hear you. 
these are children from Ma Mashongwa, where Solozi Prof so Mazesinene was born. And I do also uh, want to acknowledge uh, all our colleagues uh, who are tuning via social media and acknowledge everyone as Prof. Uh, uh, Amkize has done so. But like I do also want to uh, acknowledge uh, everyone from the Gunene Foundation, uh, from the Mazisu Gunene family, uh, from the UKZN family, between Hart College and Peter Maritzburg. Um, so we, we acknowledge all our poets who are part and parcel of uh, Poetry Africa, our 26th edition um, this year. So as I talk now about the poets, let me now welcome Dr. Ismail Mohamed, who is the director for the Center for Creative Arts, uh, who's going to come and give um, some words of support uh, as part and parcel of celebrating the life and the legacy of Professor Mazesugune. Ismail, over to you. The Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Nklantla Mekizi, the Dean of the School of the Arts, Professor Nobutre Hlongwa, our honored guest, Mrs. Kuneni, our honored speaker this afternoon, and you ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls, thank you very much for making your presence in this venue this afternoon at the 26th edition of the Poetry Africa Festival, but indeed a special afternoon where we include the Masisi Kuneni Memorial Lecture as an integral part of the festival. This memorial lecture stands side by side with the Mafika Gwala Memorial Lecture that we present in partnership with the South African History Online. It also stands side by side with a tribute lecture that we present to honor the works and life of Professor Kiero Petze Josicile. Now you ask the question, why? The answer is very simple. I would draw from the wisdom of Professor Masisi Kuneni from this board alongside you. That is, we plant it for the generations of summer who when they arrive will reap the harvest and be, and be filled with our fruit. And I unquote. We draw inspiration at the Center for Creative Arts from this kind of wisdom. And it's for this reason that this week during Poetry Africa, we were able to reach out to more than 300 learners at various schools and community art centers to be able to take some of the most distinguished poets from our country and abroad to perform, to run workshops and masterclasses at those schools. The Poetry Africa Festival is one of seven festivals presented by the Center for Creative Arts at the University of KwaZulu-Natal and under the auspices of the School of Arts. In 2020, when the national lockdown was declared by President Cyril Ramaphosa, within four days, the Center, for the Center for Creative Arts gravitated onto the online space, and it became the first South African festival to go in the online space. But more than that, in 2021, the Poetry Africa Festival, together with the Jumba Festival presented by the Center for Creative Arts, were both nominated for the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences Award for Best Digital and Online Creations, created during the pandemic. The Jumba Festival won that award. The Jumba Festival went one stage further and also won the Business Arts South Africa Award for Arts Education and Arts Activism in Communities. But that's not all. Our work with Poetry Africa is one that we're incredibly proud of and it's particularly its 26-year legacy. But this could not have catapulted in the kind of celebration we had a fortnight ago when the winner of our Poetry Africa Slam Poetry Competition 2021 competed against 40 nations in Brussels and came home with the World Slam Poetry Championship. South Africa was tops. <laughs> now, that could not have happened if the Poetry Africa Festival did not foster the kind of intergenerational dialogue that we have with poets who have passed, poets who are with us, and who are an integral part of our legacy, our cultural heritage, and I point specifically to Mamdina Mplope sitting in the front row, 
who is an in, is, was a wonderful supporter of the festival, Diana Ferris, who is our featured poet this year, and many others who continue to share their work with school learners and with the rest of the community, both in the online space and in the live space. And that would not be possible if it wasn't for the support that the Center for Creative Arts receives from the School of the Arts, the College of Humanities, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, but alongside the support that we receive from the KwaZulu-Natal Department of Arts and Culture, the KwaZulu-Natal Film Commission, the Department of Arts and Culture National, but also our ardent foreign funders, the French Institute of South Africa, the Embassy of France, and our corporate funders, Total, Total South Africa. Alongside them and their support, we've been able to bring at least 12 poets from different parts of the globe to South Africa. At least three of those poets are from the continent, and others sponsored by various embassies to be here, alongside a total number of 67 poets who have participated in this year's Poetry Africa Festival. Tomorrow evening, we present the Slam Poetry Competition, and the winner of that Poetry Slam Competition will represent South Africa in Brazil next year. Once again, we wish to go along with your good wishes, the wisdom of people such as Mazizi Kuneni, Mafika Gwala, Kieropetse Khosicile, as well as those other legendary poets who are amongst us to bring even that trophy back home. I wish you all well and thank you for being here this afternoon. Dr. Ismail Mohamed, Ismail Mohamed, with those words and that message of support. Whilst we do that, um, we will now continue with our program. And now I'm going to call upon Sisanda Shozi to come forward and render an item for us. Uh, to give a performance. Uh, Sisanda, are you here? Is she... Uh, if Sisanda is not ready, we will then request Baba Matala Gunene to come forward as and render an, an item. Uh, thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause as he comes forward. Let's give him a round of applause as he comes forward. Thank you. The Gunene family is very talented, uh, and you'll, as you'll hear for yourselves. Uh, thank you very much. San Bonan. San Bonan and Lin. Such a bull over like a lamb lunch. Get it a baffle. No bona bandana was a choosing wound. Young Chaplis are cool. Cacool. Go Baba Conaje. Masselons and my computer and the foundation. Sing at the Inco singers Amanda. Bapindi batolo wunyo nga pezu la bantuwa nangoma. Aguko wunyo fanele batlake nga kompyuta.
Something that was played by uh, young maidens back in the days of Young girls who could walk from here to Pintown without really feeling the effects of the length of the journey. This is because of the beauty of this music. I would like young girls to play this kind of music. This instrument was made of wood and then it will take uh, the tale of a uh, wildebeest. The, when the foreign came to this country, they then used metal to 
I remember my first instrument, I bought it for five cents, but I know today it costs as much as 200 rands. Tanda Rabuti Abandana Lababa Kulai Busfoon Stolo Toy. Ubaba Umata Lagune Unga Katazegi, Babagne Sazo Bana, in July, you kiss it in Kotagang, Gangless Katnam. Let us maybe hold it right there, and I hope everybody saw. Did you see the instrument that was used today, which you need to learn to use it? Let us give Mr. Gunene a round of applause, a resounding round of applause, please, for a beautiful performance. Thank you. Yes, we need somebody who's going to play the guitar like he does, and this is. A challenge students from Fuzungondo. We need an artist who's going to play the guitar like uh, Mr. Matalagnele. Just to keep time, this is under uh, around. Let us uh, ask her to come forward and maybe give her a round of applause, please. Thank you. My name is Sisanda Shung. I'm happy to be here. I'm going to do two poems. He'll connect his things and then we will. Can we give him a round of applause, please? Thank you. Lapunangi Kona, Liakani Lam. 
Kamadaki <laughs> Kwasatini Chali <laughs> Mashongwa au mnyana. Spinde simu pefuti ishombe elkulu usisanda. Arabanga sasho usisanda kutu hambisa na noba. He didn't tell us though who. And his colleague, we thank them very much. Dr. Mazibugo, uh, uh, now uh, to like introduce to um, so our many. guest speaker uh, for today. Uh, the spirit of Gunene is in this room right now. Jango Banje Usanda Esu Gandela, Jango Banje Ebega De Ela Pamwe. He was inviting Prof. Kunene to be with us today. Right now, at this moment, Nene family had informed Prof. Kunene that we are celebrating you. Uh, over to you, Dr. Mazubogo. Thank you, uh, Program Director, uh, Professor Shongwa. 
um, DVC uh, and Head of College Humanities, uh, Mama Gnene, uh, Gunene Family, uh, Mazizignene Foundation, uh, Prof. Matwane, uh, Dr. Ismail, Distinguished Guests, Shuzin Mondo High School, uh, UKZN staff, students, uh, please allow me to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, a scholar uh, of note. The lady that I'm going to introduce to you this afternoon, um, she is the new, very new, vice principal of teaching, learning, community engagement, and student support at UNISA. Uh, she has been in the vice chancellor's office as the executive director, Department of Leadership and Transformation. Uh, she has been the director of scholarship in the change management unit, the director uh, for UNISA Ethiopia Center and Chair of Department, UNISA Department of English. She has published widely on English drama, theater, African literatures, and the impact of colonial education in Africa. A Fulbright Scholar of Michigan State University, she has also supervised several masters and doctoral candidates. She's a translator and interpreter and a writer whose interest in education in Africa, identities and curriculum justice in the post-colonial era inform both her scholarly research and creative writings. She is renowned for advocating the repositioning of indigenous law and systems as the foundation for modern literature in Siswati and African literature, as can be seen in some of her Africa-centered theories of theater informing university syllabi. Her most recent publication in the Sonika Impulse explores the impact of Africa's major artistic contribution to world theater while remembering and reconstructing identities in post-war South Africa. Uh, she is a keen uh, to advocate for the recentering of Africa's ontologies in research and tuition in the university. Uh, her contribution in the higher education curriculum justice discourse has earned her international repute in the UK, Asia, and the USA. Her, publica her publications approximately 45 outputs. <clears throat> she serves in various boards as president, chief editor, and chief guest editor, both within South Africa and internationally. She has taught in several institutions, principal amongst which are the University of Swaziland, the Medical University of Southern Africa, and the University of South Africa. Her experience also includes working as a director in Ethiopia for seven years at the UNISA Ethiopia Center, where she was responsible for doctoral and master's students. She is a grounded teacher of literatures. Uh, she balances with ease and equal expertise her position of exploring the literary and grammatical word in English and in, in Siswati. Uh, her primary ethos is the positioning of the African mind as unique and equal contributor to the world tapestry of knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce to you a full professor of English, Professor Zodwa Moza, Matigani.
Bonani. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, in, in the introduction, we forgot, we, we did indicate the name of my father, uh, Mota. Where the Zulu would say Mota. Umvula, Nutlebanko, Mukati, Deunongombi. That's who I am. And the other surname is also a man's surname. Umatikani, Uwanga, Pagwakosa. Batike bona abezi. Bazi bong. Bazi e bati jalim pem vutongwa leva tambom. That's uh, the other man in these names. What I don't like about these surnames is that my mother's surname is not here but she also got it from her father, but it's okay. Um, my mother, my mother is a royal princess in the kingdom of Eswatini. Uh, I'm sure you know that beauty, you've seen it in your own kingdom. In my mom, the late um, Her Majesty Queen Mother Manvombi, Umamuam. And uh, you have seen that beauty in St. You have seen that beauty in my aunt, whom we buried two weeks ago, who kept asking, can't you put in? That was um, the late Mrs. Simpson, Umamaga, Minister Titiza. She is my father's sister. Bathe, Bathe, Batandwa Gazulu, Seabonga. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I don't know how to juggle this, but I really would like to pay tribute to someone I know very well. Yes, Le Mike. Yeah, the blog. Yeah, I want to. Tenten, please. I want to see what I'm reading. Yeah, it should be on the side. Okay, in course, in course. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I really would like to pay tribute to this giant of the soil, uh, someone that I've met personally as the chairperson of uh, the South African Literary Awards, um, which we know as Sala, someone whom I have crossed paths with in mind as well as physically. And I wanted to do justice to him and him alone. And if you feel at some point that I'm only talking to him and not to you, please bear with me. It's the nature of us literary scholars. We go into a trance sometimes. I have a disclaimer to make here this afternoon. Oh, Bantabam? I am very happy to have the young ones here. Really, I am. You've done exceedingly well, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor. I'm very happy because oftentimes we speak to ourselves as uh, uh, all this. I have a disclaimer that uh, I was asked, I think about two years ago, to prepare this lecture, and I really went all out to prepare it. And it didn't quite happen because of uh, Izimzim. Uh, Izimzim is a cannibal that stands in the way when you want to go home, and it's called coronavirus. And it disrupted us, but I panicked in the silence of everything. And I had the fear that these great ideas that I had uncovered about Professor Gunene would go unheard. Uh, so what I did, I prepared a book chapter um, that is on its way. Uh, it's from one university called UKZN. Um, it's coming out there. So some of the ideas will will Will, will be familiar to those who are preparing that book chapter, but here I have you just chill and listen. Um, this discussion, ladies and gentlemen, explores the ideas, just four ideas that come from the philosophy of uh, Professor Mazisi Gunene. These four ideas are not in my space because I'm not a philosopher in the sense that we talk about philosophy, but these ideas 
a, a resident in philosophy. I am a literary person. The discourse adva advances um, what Gunene thinks about family. What is a family? What he thinks about religion in the African space. And also I want to touch very little on the knowledge enterpri enterprise as well as the matter of uh, land politics, which are all found in Gunene's philosophies. And I am very sad that we don't study Gunene because this is very deep. I couldn't do enough. I couldn't continue. I just had to stop here. At the center of Gunene's philosophy or the Gunene's work is the desire and the agency to preserve Africa's own ideas and knowledges. So I will try to, 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 to demonstrate to you that Gunene is preaching the notion that Africa's heritage was never lost. Hence, I know that many a time we say, I don't think they left. They are here, and we have to find them. I particularly like the fact that Gunene was actually born in the same year that my mother was born, 1930. I, oof, it touched me. Uh, may her soul rest in peace. Umam, my own mom. Uh, the philosophies that I'm referring to, you will find um, in, the, in, in, the, in the interview that Professor Gunene had in 1977. So you can see between 1977 and now, there must be more, much, much more. But I'm focusing just on that. The interview that he had with uh, Chipasa Luchembe, who was then a PhD candidate uh, in economic history and at the time a member of the editorial board um, coming from the University of Zambia. So this is where if you want to go and read more, just try and uh, find out what they talked about. I just took four things. Um, Madonsel, let me do it in my mother tongue. Apologies. Mtimanze, Bambolunya, Bambolunya, Zingabatimbili, Zafute Kabonina. Prof, they have asked me to say a few words in your honor and your great intellect and the lasting gift that you left to the sons and daughters of Africa. This has been a major examination and test on me as I truly, truly struggled to find an angle to earnestly and faithfully present a person of your stature. As a scholar in the literary arts of Isizulu, Siswati, and English, our paths have crossed many times, both physically and on the canvas that carries our ideas embossed in print for posterity. Prof, I thought of uh, the onion metaphor that has many layers, but immediately I threw that out because it is both a foreign metaphor and its content, the content of the onion is the same. It doesn't change whether you go to the first leaf or the second. That is not you, Mdimanze. I thought about the boabab tree. Again, it didn't quite work for me, mainly because it is slightly a distant symbol to an African child of the southern Nguni extraction, such as we both are. Then I thought about Slatasemkanu. This is the enigma that you are, um, demands. Umkanu is the tree that produces the fruit that we call emaganu, but Swana call it amarula. This fruit is a product on its own because many head boys enjoy you know, eating it while looking after cattle, a This fruit also has something called tinganu. This is a big delicious nut inside the fruit, which is then crushed to make um, relish for umfino or oil for the body. Today, it makes a lot of uh, tissue oil. This tree also has branches and leaves that provide shelter for both animal and human. To us, Ntimanze, your richness of mind and totality of yield befits that of Umkanu tree. And I wish to salute you with this lecture. 
Pambolunya. Ladies and gentlemen, Prof. Mazisi Gunene cannot be boxed into one image. He is popularly known as a poet of excellence because he is also renowned for the cutting edge philosophy on Africa, as well as for being a grand scholar of English. Interestingly, I'm not going to spend much time on, on literary analysis, which would have been very, very easy for me because that is my field. Rather, as I said before, I'm drawn into the philosophy of Hunene and I would like us to journey together. I chose the title, Emasiswe Nibusekaya, based on the encomium, Mazibu Yemasiswe, to underscore the main thesis of discussion. Fundamentally, I align myself with Hunene's position that Africa has not totally lost her cultural scientific, religious, and linguistic heritage. This is why today we still know that this one is speaking Isizul, this one is speaking Siputi, even though it is not an official language, but it's, it's a language, it's our language. This one is speaking Sitswana because Africa has not lost its heritage. A brave declaration a mischance of Mazibuye Masisweni is therefore something that we need to stop and question and not just clap hands to. To those who may be lost uh, about this, Mazibu Yemasisweni is a considered Nguni philosophy and belief, which in my view typ typifies one of Gunene's values of life. This is the notion that had been well articulated by H.I.E. Lomo in the 1940s when Gunene was a mere 10 year old child. It calls for us all to return from the surrogate home to the natural base. Um, this is about um, when people loan out cattle to those who don't have so that their own family can gain sustenance from the milk and they can plow in the field. So where these cattle have been sent, Kusema Siswein, you scissor the cattle so that your neighbor, it's not machonisa like, um, yeah, you scissor out of goodwill so that the neighbor can have something and then uh, their dignity can be also grounded. But now comes time when that uh, resource has to return home. So we are saying mazibuye emasisweni and I'm saying actually they are here, they never went emasisweni. Um, as I said, I'm looking at the family, the religion, the knowledge enterprise, uh, African land matters, and the dynasty. Um, this may disturb you, I don't like that, but just stay while I talk. Um, I wish to then say that Gunene has never experienced any identity crisis about his, uh, uh, you know, that many of his work, much of his work is written in English because he has always um, exemplified the fact that he is a grounded African child who bespeaks the philosophies of Africa. Uh, I wish to proceed and share a few highlights of the thinking of Gunene uh, and, and, and look at the individual and, and society uh, as, as, as I underscore the fact that this was one man who was not confused about his identity. Whatever language he used, be it English or Isizulu, he is someone that we need as a, as, as a, as a model. Uh, the ancient, on the ancient debate about what society is and what an individual person's value is, um, we get the fact that these ideas are there and they, they, they confuse a lot of us. From what I read in Gunene, I read the fact that the family, the individual, and society are intertwined. The notion that we can separate these entities like uncooked spaghetti is actually very misleading amongst the Nguni, specifically Amazulu, Amakosa, Nemaswati. The family is as much a part of society 
as it is an integral part of an individual. African families are expands in the present day as well as in the historical past. Going into generations and generations of clans, this is why I was introducing myself like that, that I'm, I'm not alone. That's why when you greet me, you will say, Saubon, and then you will say, Ninja, Nimvulan, and, and I'm just one, and you'll use a plural, because there's more of us going uh, to the past and in the present. The family is a cyclic phenomenon that existed, still exists, and will exist long after this generation has faded away. Thus, the attainment, for example, of umlobogazi, a bride, is a session that involves people your dear happy never introduced to you. But when you marry into this clan, you meet these people. And he doesn't have to explain everybody to you. And they'll come and take their stance because we are expans. That's why they say in one language, you respect everybody as if they are, they are your in-laws because you don't know who you're meeting. It might be just uh, the family of your young men. Um, that is why our young men cannot propose love to a girl before establishing their clan, their lineage, and their family history. These are represented by the CV, which today we call Izibongo Ne Itagazelo. That is why you cannot marry without Umalume. You cannot marry without Ubabegazi, because family is expands. It is this unit. There are no extended relatives here. There are no second cousin twice removed here. Okay, that is the family. Let's explore more and then let us see if we are living that legacy in our daily life. We don't say, ah, uh Angwaz, -uh, I never met you. You have my surname, but who are you? You know, that is not what Gunene is preaching. Then on the matter of religion, um, I wish to say that uh, to try and present a summary of Gunene's philosophy on religion would be very disingenuous on my part. However, Gunene notes that African religion is not just a blanket, monolithic cover, because Africa is big, Africa is diverse. So religion in Africa is varied, and it's variated by the regions. Although there exists a common acknowledgement of a higher order, a higher being, whether it's West Africa, North, South, or East, there is that higher order. We call the higher order umvelingangi, but in West Africa we find uh, more expressions of spiritual forces in God, such as Ogun and others. In Southern Africa we have the force of um, what they call ancestors. The, the key is the functionality of these different forces in our lives. Some of them, I mean, sometimes we use them to, to, to look at our daily challenges which confront us. Gunene is very clear that there is no ancestral worship at all, but there is veneration. Um, uh, but he doesn't speak about us bowing down to them because there is umvelingangi, unkulunkulu, the one who's bigger and bigger than them. Okay, then let's talk about knowledge. You can see I'm doing what I'm just say I'm just you know touching uh, you know the head the, the, the you know the topics very lightly because I know there are scholars here. And please do read that interview, it is deep. Um, coming to knowledge, um, I, I wish to indicate that uh, you will all recall that uh, the knowledge enterprise is comprised of knowledge generation, knowledge packaging, knowledge dissemination, and knowledge consumption. Um, I wish to say that it is quite saddening to see how much we have neglected our own thought leader, leaders in the, in the epistemology of politics that 
we engage in, and how this neglect of our own knowledge system has distanced, distanced us from the pool of untapped knowledge systems that reside within our own common law, common knowledge. This then makes us the consumers of borrowed knowledge while our own is muted and submerged, Emma Siswen. As we don't generate our own, we don't package our own, but we follow some system and we imbibe. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is where I, I have a lot of uh, conflict with translators. Um, there are different types of translators. I am an accredited translator myself, but sometimes I find it very difficult to translate an entire syllabus of Western epistemology and put it in Isizulu or Isiswati and give it to my child when there exists an ontology of Abantuagiti and it is not being engaged. So we have to think. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to say that Africa Africans are no stranger to the, to, to the game of generating and packaging knowledge. Gunene reminds us that our mythologies on human origins are anchored on knowledge that is packaged carefully and placed in the tales for children. This is what Chinua Achebe, another gigantic African tree, calls the roadmap to life. So that most important and foundational knowledge about basic human etiquette and core human family values is placed at the premium age of zero to seven. That's where we teach certain types of izinganegwane because we're teaching certain values. Now, knowledge on human interactions uh, such as the accounts of wars, famine, the rivalries, perseverance, victories, and, and so forth, human body development and social relations is placed uh, in the tales and epics that are narrated to children who are above age seven. This is a curriculum, can you see that? And this is what we were doing, Gunene reminds us. For example, he goes to one uh, uh, Nguni creation tale which we all know, the story about um, they say it's a chameleon and a lizard, but in Tulo, ne, none. No, Yes, this is a good story and a very important, it provides a very important lesson. It describes the relationship between speed, which could symbolize death, and the timelessness of life, moving very slowly as if you are a fool, as if you have nothing to do as seen in the chameleon that moves very slowly but can see all around with its rolling eyes. Gunene says, slow movement, I'm quoting him, slow movement is not a vice. Moving slowly is not wrong. There are times where you have to slow down. It is not a vice, he says. This matter of slow movement as a virtue was once affirmed by John Milton, an English poet of equal stature to B. W. Villagazi Mazisigunene and Chinua Achebe in the sonnet on his blindness. John Milton says, those of you who know this sonnet, at the end, they also serve who stand and wait. So that when someone becomes a CEO before you, you don't have to fight them. They also serve who stand and wait. Slowness is not a vice. I want to proceed to look at, uh, uh, apologies, um, to look at um, the ways of disseminating knowledge. Uh, there is an exchange between uh, Gunene and the interlocutor, the one who is interviewing him. When I examine the near casual interchange between this researcher Chipasha Luchembe and Prof. Gunene, I can, we can almost miss the profound reflection on the African philosophy surrounding the passing of knowledge from one person to another. And to those whom we consider as strangers, the art of giving information to somebody else, he tells us how we Africans do it. 
And, and when they interchange views with, the, with this researcher, we can almost miss this very profound for, point. The interviewer is expressing his frustration with the old African folk back home in Africa who are very reluctant to give information, especially information about their people, about their culture, and about their beliefs. They just don't. They will start this story. They will stand up. Do you want some water, my child? Hey, let me check the chicken, my child. They will not. And you're sitting there as a researcher, and time is going and you've got your recorder, and you want to get this information, or you're standing there as a journalist. So, and they will not tell you. I know them. They are my mother's people. They will not give you any answer. Why? Gunene is telling us this. He opines that, but your methods, you researchers, don't show that you are African. You are an African. You went to the African. You went with a, a recorder and a camera. With this camera, you wanted to take pictures. You did not join in your own belief and became part of it. You were examining. You were a foreigner. In, effect, in fact, at that moment, you were a stranger. You were only African by sight. So it was correct that our people must find it inc very contemptible that we, we go to them in this manner as the Europeans did. You don't do that. There are ways of knowing. You have to be initiated. Those are the ways that you should learn as an African researcher. The ways of knowing, he tells us. This touches on fundamentals of African ethics, ladies and gentlemen. Gunene brings forth the basics of res respect and recognizing that even a stranger is a human being first. Even someone you want to know more about, whatever level of economic standing they may be, they are human beings first. There is a way of getting prized information about the people you don't know. Researchers, in my view, should not come with the approach of us and them. The same philosophy is actually well captured in Doris Lessing's um, Six Piece of Country, of the Country. It's a short story. Um, I don't know if you know the short story. It's quite interesting. People come to this African land. They've heard that there is a, a, a piece of um, plant that is curing people. And then they travel all the way from the west. They want to get this plant. And they come to the village. And in this village, nobody uh, is willing to tell them. But quite late in the day, about 12. I hope it's not mine. I think it's my son, but just forget it. <laughs> Apologies. I was looking for it. I didn't know where it was. Apologies. Let's just ignore that. I didn't know. And in this village, uh, nobody was prepared to help the, 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 these researchers who had come from the West. And quite late in the afternoon, a young man just said, OK, I will go with you. They went to the mountain. They walked all the way up and down. Still, they couldn't find the plant. And then quite late in the evening, he just bent down and picked up um, a piece of a plant that had been there all the time and gave it to them. By that time, you know that, uh, I mean, as Africans, you know that there are certain types of uh, herbs you can pluck out in the morning during the time where there is dew. They can work. There are certain types of herbs that you can only take from the ground with the roots, others you cut. I mean, you, you, you know these things. But you cannot teach these things to someone who comes and says, eh -eh, what is making you tick? Show me the medicine and then they want to go away with it. This is what Gunene is uh, responding to. He says, we don't respond to those who are judging us. Knowledge clearly is precious. This is why you don't just take a picture of a newborn baby and you post it. You don't. This is why you don't just post yourself soon after delivering a baby on social media. 
There is a good reason why a woman who just has had a, who has just had a baby Gainers and lean for three months in my culture to protect this human being who may be susceptible to a myriad of diseases and other forces. You're not being archaic, you're protecting. Because remember, it's this child, it's you, it's everybody that are connected to this child. I want to move to that was the knowledge enterprise, the dissemination, the analysis the preservation of that which we have. I want to move down to um, land matters. Kunene talks about the continent of Africa and the value of land to the African. Um, I know this is a very emotive topic. The reason it is very emotive is that land identity, family, being, are actually, they, they actually make who we are. If you are dislocated from land, then you cease to be. As you, as you know, when we identify one another, then we know, we locate you by the environment from which you come. If you have been removed from there and placed elsewhere, you don't know where you come from. And land is not a commercial entity. That's why we're confused that we fought uh, for liberation, for the reclaiming of Africa, but we still have to buy uh, land back. Uh, or maybe you don't buy land here. They call it plots. Zituru, zituru, zituru. You don't know if it is your own. I'm not inciting you. It's something that really hurts me, that our forefathers, had this land, they were moved about, then we got independence, then now we must buy plots, millions of rents. And land informs your identity. Let's hear what Gunene says. I'm talking about land claim and land mapping. I want to quote some uh, line from one of my friends in England, he says, cartography is a colonial game. This is an Englishman with whom I wrote a book about uh, 15 months ago. So I wish to posit this point that mapping is a technology of possession. Whoever draws the map, whoever has the guts to say, this is the map of Africa, it is this big. He is, he or she, but usually they were men, he is practicing possession. Then he will name that place. You're standing there, you belong to it. Then he will name. This is, these are the points that Gunene raises. There is a notion of unprospected lands and the monologic of land, land that belongs to someone. This one-sided logic has led to the describing Rescribing of the empire. There are people who frame themselves as transcribers and namers of towns, namers of countries, namers of places, and namers of things unclaimed. They even name oceans. An ocean that is so close to Africa is called the Ocean of India. <laughs> Hence, we ended with uh, the Indian Ocean. We ended with King Edward. We ended with Port Elizabeth. We ended with Durban. These are well-known English personae. We also ended with the suffix, suffix land, like Zululand, Basutuland, Bechuanaland, uh, Swaziland, behind the names of the countries that were colonized. Kings were named paramount chiefs. So land ownership and renaming has made Africans spectators in their own land, imposing foreign language, foreign culture, foreign knowledge, and foreign relationship with the land that was theirs. This is why the perfect family was one that only had one mother, one father, 
one girl, two boys. There's no Malume, there's no Babom Nane, there's no Tatubab. That is the picture of a perfect family. And then when you come and say, hey, maybe my father died yesterday. You're talking about Babom Nane because to you that's your father. But next week, when your biological father dies, then it's like you're lying. Reorganizing the family, reorganizing your relationship with the land. These are the ideas that Gunene posits. This is what we call psychological or cognitive violence to the African. Gunene posits an opinion about the not so factual rescribing of the African continent in the maps that we have, the maps that we teach our children. He says that the map of Africa is much bigger in real terms than what we have. Please go and study this, this, this because it, it becomes much bigger in the sense that you would find Russia, um, North America, South America fitting in the map of Africa. But if you look at, uh, for example, a country like Eswatin, it's so small you want to laugh, but they try and drive. There will come a time that you, you drive the whole night having not crossed through that country. It once happened to me. I thought it was very small. It would just take me two hours. No, you must add guess. Who drew that map? How factual is that map? This is what Gunene is asking us to think about. How factual is the, the size of the map of Africa? If that map is so compromised, what else is compromised? Who is the one who is scribing for you? And where are you when the Noah is naming it Africa, is naming it this and that? So this is about the positionalities of continents, Africa and Europe. He does a very, very wonderful job on that. I want to proceed because all he is saying is that sometimes what we read in the geography book has been very simplified. So we need to actually apply our minds about it. OK. Uh, this ideology of uh, the weight of, of the land and how it has been abused to eventually abuse the, the person who lives in it actually takes me to just a few, as I move towards uh, a close of some of my examples. Um, w when I read M. Parashaka the Great, I find something quite interesting. I will not use the literary angle again. I've done it, uh, I, I think we've all done it very well. But I want to take a, a slightly different angle in, in appreciating this input from Gunene. Gunene uses literature to preserve the great heritage of the African Amazulu. Literary scholars will agree with me that Actually, M. Parashaga the Great is an epic in both the African and European sense of standard in literary appreciation. An epic is, is a lit literary writing which is in adulation of a hero for the sake of retelling a story of greatness. That's what John Milton tells us uh, in, in Paradise Lost. What is an epic? An epic is a great long poem that adulates, praises, and loads a hero who has a great story to tell in order that we preserve that legacy. So in Paradise Lost, John Milton is doing this about um, the story of creation in the Bible. He feels it's a great story that needs to be told, and we need to praise the hero, uh, the heroes that are there in order that we, we, we actually um, you know, preserve their greatness. This is the same feat that we find in Emperor Shaga the Great. I've heard many scholars criticizing Gunene on his writings, particularly scholars in the field of African languages, which I'm very versed with. They sometimes get lost with Gunene. But uh, thank God Almighty, I also have the angle of uh, European literature in me, and I can understand where he is coming from. Actually, we miss the point in our criticism of Kunene, uh, raising the point that 
he is glorifying King Shaga. People say, why must he glorify King Shaga? Eh, we are King Shaga was a murderer and so forth and so on. Why is Gunene doing this? He's lost the plot. I've heard this from scholars, particularly in African languages. And Angisha when, uh, uh, Angisha when uh, uh, prof, I don't mean you. I haven't heard that from you. Ladies and gentlemen, glorifying the hero is what epics do. If you choose a hero, be it a tree, be it a tail, be it a person uh, like King Shaga, epics glorify the hero. Gunene then knows the genre for this kind of poem that he has chosen to write. Similar but not identical to Mufulo's Chaga. He is praising this hero. There was a hero named Shaga, and this poem sets out to do that and tick 100% I give him. I was almost... Um, I was almost stoned by my Facebook friends one day. Abangazi, um, I make a lot of noise about tradition on Facebook. Then I was saying to them, you know what, um, you know, uh, I read somewhere that Shaka is actually, okay, I was correcting them that Henry Kale is not Shaka. They were not happy. You know, I was saying, no, 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 this is an actor. He used to play so, no, 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 Kalile, Prof, Kalile, stop it. So I stopped. And then I found many like, 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 like those that were opposing me, so I came back. But this is a historical fact that I read, that Shaka was not dark-skinned. He was light-skinned. They said, no, don't unshaga us. No, 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 no. <laughs> don't unshaga us. He wasn't. And I read that um, he, he was actually not as vicious as, as, as we make him to be. And, and his uh, upper teeth were jutting just out a little. But no, 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 no. You know what? We're going to block you. And I think I was blocked, but I just laughed. I want to say, let's go and find out. Let's go and find out. Because who is scribing the image of Shaga that you know? Same applies to Ndombas. Was she really a witch? What else were the other women doing at the time? Who is scribing the ideas that go into your mind? So I find Emperor Shaga the Great, a, a very wonderful poem, uh, epic. It is an epic in the true sense of the epic. And if I were to summarize it in one idiom, I would say, this one you would call by it the when I went love. That's what he is out to do. And that epic does that very well. And as for the anthem of the decades, it, it, it is giving us, um, it's un, using mythology about how the universe was um, created from the point of view of Amazulu and their great knowledge. And this one I would say, maybe we would say, this is what, but uses the position of women very, very well. And there is no demeaning of women in this epics, and I appreciate that position of praising, this is what we do as Abangoni, that position of preserving history, this is what we do as Abangoni, that position of uh, giving women their due, their, their due stance, because they can be queens, they can be um, army generals uh, in our own history, and that's what uh, Gunene is doing. He does that, what we know, and he preserves it. You will remember that in Shakespeare we have things that we call a play within a play. But here in Gunene we have something strange. A play, poetry, proverb, myth, intermixture. He is worthy of our praise, really. This is wonderful. Indeed, I want to say, in Dabapeda, is a kai, i.e. kwemasiswen. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, using only Western modalities as frames of reference in our critiquing uh, presents, presents the potential to pre deprive us of the richness of our scholarship, as we have seen in the case of Gunene. He says in one uh, area that we are the trustees of our own knowledge. I want to quote him. So we would say that we are the trustees for the next generation. What we have is actually not ours. It belongs to those who came before and those who will come after us. Then you see, 
we are dealing with one aspect that may exclude a lot of other things in terms of African philosophy, in terms of African people, and in terms of the African community. So he is reminding us that what we have belongs to those that are coming behind us, so we must preserve it. Um, I just want to quickly go uh, just to, I want to quickly move to something um, as I think I've demonstrated enough about Gunene and his position. Um, Gunene um, challenges the misinformation that uh, knowledge is only from the West. And, and I think he agrees with me. I don't know whether it's me who agree with him or it's him who agrees with me, but we find one another that we have knowledge systems in our own space. And these are false claims. I want to demonstrate this point uh, by quoting uh, from uh, a paper that I wrote, I think it was uh, 2016, 2017. If you can see the quotation, wherein I indicate that um, the, the, the first universities were in Africa, the University of Timbuktu, that came long before the colonial uh, universities. Um, actually, Walter Rodney explains to us what kind of syllabus was in that, university, in those, in that particular university. Actually, this is where uh, former state president Mbegi even commissioned that we get the Timbuktu manuscripts and see what the university in Africa was like before colonialism. And that's a prime moment for us to actually not just be convinced that higher education, uh, that we, ha we did have higher education. This was a serious university. I have the manuscript, I've read them, and really I have seen that some of the, the great works that I've been studying as an English scholar, some of it actually came from Africa. This then wants us to ask, if Aristotle, if uh, Plato, if Pythagoras had to spend something like 20 years in Egypt, somewhere in Africa, learning mathematics and other forms of sciences, and then going back to Greece and then becoming the fathers of knowledge, is it not, uh, aren't we supposed to be stoned for ignoring the fact that Africa had knowledge that we need to find. Please read the Timbuktu manuscripts. That was a great project, repositioning us and telling us that we have what it takes. Let us not perpetrate the misinformation uh, that uh, Gunene is, is actually advising us against. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this is not only the, the, the matter of decoloniality speaks to what I'm saying. Colonialism comes with a form of education that says nothing in Africa, all comes from the West. But countries like, um, Af I mean, uh, continents like Africa, South America, that have suffered colonialism are beginning to question our syllabi. I like this one, it comes from one person uh, with whom I've spent quite a, lo a lot of time, he asks, the main questions addressed are the following. How is it, how is it possible that the canon of thought in all the disciplines of the social sciences and the humanities in the westernized university is based on knowledge produced by five men, an Italian, a Frenchman, an Englishman, a German, and a man from the USA? It seems like trivializing issues, but we, we know, we professors say, no, 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 you didn't quote enough international scholars. You know, you didn't quote them. But these are the people who seem to be holding the backbone of our higher education. Um, Ramon Hrosfukel continues to say, how is it possible that men from these five countries achieved such an epistemic privilege to the point that their knowledge today is considered superior over all. This is a very fundamental question. You can see I'm a very peaceful person. 
but this one really makes me cry. Because I know what my grandmother taught me. It is not being taught anyway. She's gone. I know what my mother and my father taught me. It is not being taught anyway. They are gone. The next thing, I, it's me and my children who don't speak so much. They, they don't speak it well. I'm always correcting them. No, ushokanje, ushokanje. When they are left, it will be all gone. This is urgent, ladies and gentlemen. I do declare I'm a very peaceful person, but my being peaceful does not mean that we should compromise what we have. And my being peaceful, actually, I'm very different from other scholars who say, drive them to the sea. I am not one of those. I am saying, let's learn from them, but let them allow me to also exhibit that which they think is a masiswen and is a kai. As I proceed towards the end, um, I wish to maybe just give you the source of this. Uh, if you can copy it, you'll find more of that. Let us not mistreat the African child. The African child has their own uh, forefathers' heritage that is not Emma Siswain. Let us go ahead and teach them what we have in our folk tales. Let's spend time and think and create philosophies upon philosophies about our folk tale, about our philosophy of, um, uh, you know, uh, mathematics, you know, the counting that I was taught by my father who had never been to school. These cognitive empires that we are using will end up erasing everything that we ever stood for, and we will forever be sorry that we never listened to Ugunene. Ugunene then reminds us about the ultra agency of reclaiming our heritage, which is not dead. Reclaiming our arts and linguistic legacy, it is very urgent that we decolonize post-colonial studies, ladies and gentlemen, because we will, we will actually make true the cry of Amakao Suguti, Indeed, the cattle will bolt the crawl. But for now, I truly believe that we have what it takes. That is why I'm saying that Emma Sisweni, Kusekai, Zikululen, Ziolta, Emma Lelwen, Zibuya Ziseng, Wei, Silimesi Chabul. Nyabo. Another big round of applause for Professor Zodwa Mosa Matigane. Emma Sisweni Gusekaya. Oh, Gosiam, Kushanatis is Ulas Doliga. Um, Amatini so Angel, and Tina Sikini so Liabab Liababaha, Ikiniso, Loga Besguzo and Jenga Manje, Amatiniso. And this is the decolonial project that what we are about, especially as the College of Humanities, I want to state this. This is the decolonial project that is what we are about. When we visited Tanzania with Prof. Mkize and Dr. Lamini, I'm happy Dr. Lamini is also here. <laughs> We met Zulu kings there. And Prof. Zoda Matigana, they were light skinned. Just like Um Logombane. Light skinned. Yebo siyazu swa yeko numbombo shomnyam. Kotwa, iningi la makosi etu agazul. Ayakanya. Ayakanya ngeba. Gishona 
the truth need to be told but we are afraid of telling the truth let us not be afraid of telling the truth this is about our identity this is about our land um, on Sunday in my church um, I was asked um, to to kind of like give a legally background on, on the missionaries, the missionary project, and um, where, where I go, like which is UCCSA, how it, how it came about, uh, and so forth, and what was, the mis what, what was the missionaries about, and so forth. And um, we were supposed like to uh, maybe start with the national anthem of that country. Some, some were given um, other countries and all of that. And I was given South Africa. And um, I requested the church to sing the national anthem, but we only took certain versions of the national anthem, the versions that are in indigenous languages, for the reasons that I explained to the church. Because if you go to the other versions, the English and the Africans version, Prof. Mota, they talk to the issue of land. They talk to the issue of land. And why is the issue of land in English and in Africans? Why is the issue of land in English and Africans? Why is the issue of land not in Isusutu? Why not in Isutu? Why not in Isuzulu? Because of time, we were supposed to engage. Dr. Mazibu was supposed to come. We engage, we ask um, Prof. Prof. Zoda Matigane questions and we engage. But like time is not always on our side, always not on our side. Um, and uh, we have a program that is starting at 1900. So at this time, because of time, I would have loved that like we engage a lot. But like what I like, uh, Prof, with your presentation is that you are even giving us sources. Go and read this. Go and read this. So we are a university. We are a knowledge production. We are going to read, Prof. And those young learners, abashele lapa emuva, bakuzwile. Bakuzwile, bazo funda, bazo kula bazi. Nga makriniso, ngoptina, that is our identity. So ladies and gentlemen, if you may allow, may I now um, uh, continue with the program uh, and uh, now request uh, performance, um, which will be uh, rendered by Dr. Tlina Mshope, and as uh, Dr. Klinam Shope comes, um, Professor uh, Toro Mohino Kambayashi, who is a, a postdoctoral fellow uh, of the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, uh, will also uh, accompany Dr. Klinam Shope. Dr. Klinam Shope is the executive director of the Namasigo Art and Heritage Trust. So as we celebrate, Professor Mazisu Gunene's legacy. You must know that Gunene's work has been translated in several international languages. And we are proud that um, Emperor Shaga the Great has been translated in Isizulu, Siaitola, Unotu Gamens. So we do want um, this book to be translated in other South African languages. And there is also a translation in Japanese. So that is why this, this, this performance right now is crucial. And over to you, Dr. Mklope. Exactly. Sitifumani bo 
Bom sole tu, bom mani, di kakambi le di kini se. Siti bom mani, bom sole tu, bom mani, di kakambi le di kini se. Siti bom mani, bom sole tu, bom mani, di kakambi le di kini se. Siti bom mani, bom sole tu, bom mani, di kakambi le di kini se. Sitting for money, what comes on? Sitting for money, what can't be lending can you say? Sitting for money, what comes on it? For money, the car can't be lending can you say? Sitting being a little kaya. Sitting being a little sun, one and a kaya. Sitting do me lang, to be lang. Ralocha, what any more Africa mache? What any more Africa mache? Sian being elela, Sian Shonipa, Masculman and says Auntie Mande, Uban Polunye, Sikulma, come as this good name, it's a Zandala. Oh, Magatebona must be Zika Malake, see us good paningi by a Sondela, Ababe Hamba Naye, see a Maz, Uguti, Ababem Tanda, Ababe Hamba Lenjela, Gishenga Gaza, Rayena, into Zoshano to Manamakae, see Ababis Abba Sondele, Sibizono Gutelam Dima, Sibizinto Zoshe Archolobe, OAC Jordan, Sibizom Kai, Sibizom Simang, Abizanba Sondele, Ayanya Zama Tambo, or Noni Chabafu, Ayanya Zama Tambo, or Yeah, 
Ebange kwa zulu. Belubiga lapa na lapa ya utumo kwa bahamba yo. Kwa uze ulalele imbongi. Ea zbone langa mesho lezi zikika ba. Iti ukasela kate lulu. Luba kasela. Ukasela kate luba kasela. Lua kasela upungashe. Waka ptelezi. Lua kasela usomtaba. Uomtanda. Eleze bandla. Lua kasela umatingwane wasengo nyameni. Lua kasela. Umangaza emamba teni, luakasela, um zazama, wagama chola, luakasela, umhaba, wagam pegana, luakasela, ukambushe, emampontweni. Enton Zolane, Luya Uzo Uzo Uzon Zwane, Luya Lucezi, Luya Luzon Zobele, Lubege is the sangue matulwe. Oh lesinye, it lesinye. What is this in you? 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 Oh, Sangu, Sangu, Luzo, Luzo, Shumayezana, Ushaza, Luinyongo, Yembuzi, Uvemvane, Lugapunga. Luma bala, ezizinge, ang, angati, abegiwe. Umzizima, ongaga matunzi, ezintaba. Kona, kushwa, kuhamba, aba, aba, kata, aba tagati. Kona kushwa, kuhamba, aba tagati. Kona kushwa, lapo. Inga, inga, kapunga, no makeba. Engi buge nge buge nge ngaze nga ichwa ela. Uma songo ma le. Ogo kaba kwa yo. Engi buge ngaze nga ichwa ela. Mtaka baba ya kaba osenga yo ya kaba ya ziatela umbambi. Uhele hele. Engi mbone, ugwesha, kwezga, mangaineza. Bati hele, hele, inangu, inangu. Bati hele, hele, inangu, inangu. Kanti utule ema shatini, njenge zingwe, nezingonyama, ushaga, wayaka makiba. Pagati, kwe nzuze, notugela, kwe liga nyanga, wawa manzawane. Wala umatondo umtagalavi. Wamuzwa ugubaba wake waze wamkafula. Ipuma kuno tumethezi gamenzi. Mabe wae mshafuna kshafuna guna za mkafule njengosia. Basate shafuna kshafuna ya skali taste. Banja na bantu bamu lape move. Banja na ma VIP. Banja na ma VIP lape move. IAP la ma VIP. Auzwa, 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 auzwa. IAP la ma VIP ni atogoza. An event of this nature without the VIPs would be a mess. There's no other way to put it. So I'm, I wish to thank every single one of you, the professors and the organizers of CTA, every person. Now, this is my time. I'm going to turn to you. Africa. You know the story, Tinage. I love you. Gizo funda lana now from Emperor Shaga the Great. Gizo tu ngampu ngampu nje. The Mteto army spread out over the hills, hurrying forward to meet its wing of the Zulus. The whole 
earth seemed silent to listen only to their voices. Branches of trees drooped mourning for the crimes of men. When the Mtetwa army approached Zwide's Lovunga royal city, they set up their temporary camps. Dingiswayo did not rest. He roamed everywhere, frothing in anger like someone who had taken a bitter bath, a bitter herb. Finally, he called his um, generals and commanders and said, I want to go and see Zwide myself. I want him to know the true ruler of Nguniland in, is Dingiswayo. I shall not even enter his grounds with my army. They listened in disbelief at these words. Fearing lest Zwide's hypnotic medicines had conquered his mind, they tried hard to restrain their king. It is better to wait for the Zulus or else to launch our army in all its strength. Let our king not go there alone. Let him not rush to the wild man of Langa. For indeed, it might be this very trap he had planned for him. But these words were like water on a dog's back. He was determined to confront this evil man, to tell him with fierce words his crimes against Nguniland, such as the follies of which who believed in their own truths, who deceive themselves that the world is halted by their outrage, or else driven to new directions by the violence of their words, Dingiswayo, reared up in anger, are there no more heroes amongst them, Tetwas? Is there none that shall listen to me? Has Zwide drained all the courage from the once brave nation? I want only a few courageous men the, the, to accompany the king of them, Tetwas, to look and see what is going to happen. He took a few steps forward. It was then that they competed for the honor, rushing to escort him to the village city of King Zwide. Among them were some of the Mtetwa royal clan. They were only a small body of men. Since Tingiswayo no longer desired to settle, into, to settle issues through battle, indeed, he thought such a war could only absolve Zwide, making him look like an opponent over superior issues. Hiding from all the downright wickedness of his crime, Dingiswayo believed his anger was enough. With it, he would crush the evil creature that was Zwide. When he reached the top of the hill of the goat, he found himself face to face with Zwide's guards. When they tried to seize him, he scolded them, pushing them aside, saying, Hey, Nina, what is this that stands in front of the king? Take me at once to your fearful king, Zwide. They fell back, saluting him with the Mtetwa royal names. They guided him to the inner sanctuaries of uh, uh, Lovunga royal city, Zwide. On hearing of Dingiswayo's arrival, said, Go and tell the king, I thank him for his visit. I give him my fattest and best cows for a feast. Even though Dingiswayo was fuming with anger, his heart softened, thinking perhaps Zwide had chastised himself. He even secretly praised the success of his uh, latest strategy. Days passed as he waited to see Zwide. On each day, a word came reporting his ill health. But it was only to confuse and weaken Dingiswayo. Zwide himself began to doubt the success of his plan. His mother, Queen Tombazi, 
daily infused in him her own ideas, urging him to seize his moment for his final glory. Zwede's spies reported how closely the Zulus had approached his capital. It was this that made Zwede panic, for he knew should Shaga arrive, he, would bound, he was bound to attack. Alarmed at these events, Zwede sent a messenger. Go and tell Dingiswayo, I command him to my presence. Dingiswayo reared his royal head and said, Who is this who dares summon me? A king! He shook his head like an elephant harassed by a wasp. He threatened all Zwede's agents, his anger befogging his mind. Even the messengers of Zwede retreated from, from him in terror. King Dingiswayo set out for Zwede's court, eager to confront him and flay him with his fierce words. He found Zwede surrounded by a large body of his counselors. Zwede spoke mockingly. All hail, king! who has no respect for the sun. You, who do not fear the power of the ancestors, you enter the front gates and exit through the back. As he spoke, Dingiswayo realized how he had let himself into Zwede's hands. He did not speak many words. He only said, I believe once our land of Nguni land should flourish, with a great sense of brotherhood and peace, I did not see then the worms that infest its very heart. I am sad, not for fear of death, but for many who shall see the coming of the vultures. Ngabo. Gitela Simupe Izandla U Dr. Tinam Shope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that lovely performance. May I now uh, call on stage? Um, I want to read the name correctly Professor Tomohiro Kambayashi Uida. Please, on stage. Come on stage. A big round of applause. We are Kulum and Alisizul. We are Kulum. Thank you so much. Um, Sani Bonani. Ika Malami, Ngu Tomohiro, Gipuma, e Japan. Gia Jabula, Ukuni Bona, Bande, Bate, South Africa. South Africa. Gia Pakulu, thank you so much. Gia Jabula, Pakulu, Ukubona, Mama Kunene. I'm very happy to see you. Mrs. Kunene, Wabakashela, a Japan, Gonyakaka, nineteen seventy. In nineteen seventy, Kunene, Wafunda, E. A a Japan. About Shah's place in Japan. And this book was translated into Sizulu. I'm going to read a chapter, the first chapter of this book. Th thank you so much. May I please be allowed to speak as Zulu? Representative of African National Congress, along with his fine fundraising activities, Kunene performed his poems and Izibongo of Shakar before a Japanese audience. Even though they translated from English, Japanese translators of Kunene's work uh, try to be sincere to the Isiziri original. Kunene helped them by sending audio tapes in which he, he explained the pronunciation of Isiziri vocabularies. I will read the first section of Japanese translation of Emperor Shaka the Great, Unodo Meshezi, Chesi Kamenzi. I hope by uh, this reading I can pay respect to the connection 
uh, Kunene and Japanese translators built. Uh, その他の伝承の歌で我々が地平の境界線を打ち破りこの高爆たる大地をその他の伝承の歌で満たされんとその他は歌う人々は力にあふれ人々はその足で夜の衣装を引き裂き人々は第一に新しい生命を刻み込む
knowing that Ubaba left Amashongo, so, so that you, you, you can get a free education. And every day you go past his resting place and no one says a word about him. I want to especially thank the Board of Trustees of Mazisu Kunene Foundation, the founders, long-suffering human beings that I've ever known on earth. Usually people sit on boards because they get a little, you know, air ticket there or to do this and that. They give in their precious time their resources to maintain and keep the museum doors open. That's not what South African individuals are supposed to do. We have a country with an ex inexhaustible budgets to help us retain and protect our heritage. Dr. Rajab, please get up. I want to see you. John Charter, I want you to see you. Is Andres here? Where are the other trustees who are here? You see how diverse this board of trustees, the most incredible, <laughs> is Coral here? Coral Bijou, I was shocked when we were in a meeting discussing the final publishing and editing of Uno Dumeche's garments. And Andres looked at Coral and said, Coral, you're going to head this. I said, was this man mad? I mean, she doesn't write, this is Zulu. She, she said, no, she's going to be the one. And I know it came as a shock to the professors here, but you know, knowing who she was, her passion, and her love for the preservation of Mazisu Kunene, she headed this project to the end. I know Professor Otungumana sometimes got very impatient with her, but the last lines of the printing of this, we were only the two of us down at Peter Murray's back to make sure that everything was aligned, everything was in place. It was the two of us. So color, all has nothing to do with Kunana's work. You saw it today. Sometimes I think I was married to a madman. I, I sometimes do think, how can anybody write 20, 30, 85,000 words and this thing makes sense? And sometimes he'd say to me, when are we fooled in those, um, why don't you ever read what I write? Hey, I said, look, I, one madman is enough in the family. So continue doing what you are doing. I don't often read my sister's work. I think I will go mad because I have the responsibility of protecting and watching these incredible manuscripts rot. These two acts I selected personally. The young poet from the village, I wanted him to recite a poem about Steve Biko. This is a solemn poem that Tumazisi wrote, Biko. He was taken from this university. He was taken, he was a student here, young man, aspiring medical student, and murdered. This place is a holy place. As we were driving up, 
I just imagine was this is coming from am I long? It took you about two hours on the bus, one hour. Those days he had to come on some train and some and not even were allowed to hang around this campus. He had to come in, take notes, and get out of this campus. We should all be accountable to those people who gave their lives, their blood, and their own youthful energy for all of us to be where we are. There's a sense of entitlement sometimes when people are in certain positions, they'll decide, no, we don't want this in our syllabus. No, we don't want Mazis's work, or there's no budget. I was shocked when we had a meeting with China the other day, and she said, I can get Mazis's work into the syllabus. I know somebody. I looked at her, I said, try. You try. And she burst into tears. I told her, I said, go ahead, try. No, I'll stop you. This is the reality. This is the truth. And now, 16 years after Kunene's passing, I step him down. I don't want to be this kind of hero. I don't want my children to be this kinds of hero. They have not had a life at all. Every penny they earn, I, why don't you give it to your father? Why don't you get, add salaries here? Why don't you do this and that? I would like to release my children and release myself. So sometimes people think that I just want this thing. It's because I cannot do otherwise. I made the promise. I did promise him that I'd look after his work. But right now, game is up. Something new has to happen, and I'm not waiting anymore. I am not waiting anymore. It is not a nice thing to see Papers, books. I mean, sometimes you saw, oh, I, I saw this paper last year. Or, oh, why is it, it has holes? It's gone. It's gone. Why is it so difficult? I always feel that sometimes when I'm emotional about something, Kunene just puts something in my place. I was just looking through papers preparing for the visit of the poets the other day, and I found this piece of paper. I didn't study to be a librarian, but I do honor my, my sister's papers. And I found this piece of paper. It is 1989. Dear sir, recently I had the privilege of reading several of your poems in a collection. Print, it printed by uh, Penguin in 1984. I was disturbed and moved by the verses. I was intrigued and further disturbed by the knowledge that I know as little about African poetry as I do. This is a teacher in the United States. This confusion has become very important to me as I begin planning for the fall. I'm a high school English teacher. With the help and urgings of a colleague, I managed to, to convince the principal of the high school that our department and other departments here at Alba, Alba Martel high, high School needed to incorporate more multicultural programs into the curriculum. Mine has been a quiet but persistent battle for four years. Now I have been allowed to pave, to, just to prove the worth of the course. My love for African and Afro-American literature 
began 10 years ago while I was a student at Fordham University in New York. There I first met Gwendolyn Brooks and Langston Hughes and uh, was hit by Ellison and all these people. Now having the opportunity to introduce my high school students to these and other African writers years before I ever did at their ages, I would like to compile a list of politically, stylistically diverse and accessible authors of two factors. I would like to enlist your advice and suggestions because you have moved and confused me. Are there any teachers in South Africa who are confused and moved by Mazisi's Kunene to insist that the books, not just Mazisi, of African writers be made a priority in the curriculum in South Africa, if not now, when? When is a good time to do it? I'm telling you, she's always holding me by the thread. Every morning she sends a little message. She keeps my spirit up because she is that kind of person. So to make a little light part, because now Dr. Mota said, Ukunene wrote in Isi Zulu, uh, everything, he just was not ever moved by anything to try and be anything. You'd like to know that I was proposed marriage in Paris in Sizulu. I mean, who does that? You go to Paris, you want to hear I love you. <laughs> Uh, and then he tries to sing a love song. I said, okay, 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 I said, I said, what is this? It's not romantic. He was that Zulu. <laughs> and so, and so I find this uh, uh, letter, I was, back in South Africa, and he was miserable in London and missing me. So he writes this letter, and outside it says, Hamburger le pepper love. <laughs> <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't mistake him for anything but who he was. <laughs> so the young scholars from Guadalupe, they know what we're about. We're about quality. And we're not waiting for anybody to teach us how to teach our children quality. We've been at that institution for the last 10, 11 years. When we got there, the pass rate was 39%. And my son says, mom, don't say pass rate. Say the fail rate is 71%. And we stuck with it because every day these children go past the resting place, Gamazisi. We turned it around. We built um, a, what we call a, science, a center of excellence. We didn't want to call it a library. It has to have some elevated, the center of excellence. The children feel loved. Somebody really cares for their minds. We moved from there and through the collaboration with the Bidville Freight Group for 11 years consistently, they have paid for after school tutors. Well, try that with any department and say, eh, Manjanage, uh, we need to renew the grant that I had. Oh no, where is the Where's the, where's the sleep for the screwdriver? You, you, uh, uh, where's this? And that would be the end. That's the end. But this institution 
called the Mazisuku Nene Foundation Trust, and the beloved trustees have been patient. They've been patient with you, South Africa. They've been really patient because they are committed. Not only them, the business community in Umbilo, they have surrounded Gunene. If the first people I call with this, there's a breaking or anything, I call Ian and he would show up there. And the last time when there was a break in, she got called the police station once, twice, no. And Ian went there and you could see the pictures, him leading and the cops coming behind him into the, into the foundation. And within 24 hours, he had called a security company said, install the institute they could now. And I was in the United States. That's passion for you. That's understanding the value. That's knowing that we owe it to all these people. Where we are today, that we can sit here and have institutions of, of ed higher education that are managed by us. Should there not be a change? Should not there be a significant impact on the quality of education and the intent to hold on to our heritage? I just want to let you know, I've just come back from a 90-day tour of the United States. I went to all kinds of institutions. And if I walk in there, somebody said, are you from South Africa, really? Didn't we help you free Mandela and write all these fancy constitutions? Are you back again begging? Somebody confronted me in Washington, D.C. And I sort of mauled, I couldn't say anything. And they say, we'll take this manuscript. We will take this, we will go and pick them up, we will digitize them, we will store them, and when South Africa is ready, we can bring them back. I was too ashamed. I went to the toilet and cried. They said, we'll buy them. What's your problem? This is the message I want to leave with you today. We have to really adjust our priorities. Just be totally so, reflective. We shouldn't scare the children by neglecting their heroes. It's a new it's a new breed. It's called unemployed artists. We've got the Department of Arts and Culture with the Ministry, we've got the Deputy, the DG, the Double DG, we have the National Heritage, we have nine Provincial Arts and Culture, but there's a new breed called the Unemployed Artists. And then we say, who? Koloma Power, oh, my God, there are all these homeless people who are hungry, we all scream. We ought to take care of business. I want to thank the Kunene family um, for finding me a husband and a partner for life. And I honor them by keeping the promise to him that I would actually look after his work. And most times, I come from the corporate world. Otherwise, there would not be any Mazisi here. I worked, I sold beads in the streets of Los Angeles, I cooked for Michael Jackson, I did everything, and still had four children, and I did graduate from UCLA, by the way. So I'm that kind of person, very resilient. When I came back here, 
I said, what is this BE story? I want some of that cake. What is this BE story? I got into it. If you see King Shaka International Airport, I was on that board for 10 years. And when I found out that there was a thing called a corporate, uh, what is it, a CSI? Corporate something, something that every uh, project has to give to a community. My hand was up. And I applied for the 4 million rand that we got to build the center of, of excellence. So you know, when you get into the BE space, you must have integrity, you have, have good intentions, you must know that you are there to represent the community, not to buy a new Mercedes Benz. That's what it is. So Iguazu Zimondo has, and I think because we were so emotional, when we got to Iguazu Zimondo and we met the principal, Ukon, there he is. I said to him, if I'm going to spend my money here and my time, let me tell you my expectation. And we bought him a ticket to go to Los Angeles and visit a number of high schools, go to UCLA, and when he got back, and I said, nah, you see now, this is what I expect of you. He's been under my all the time. And that's why we came with this amazing turnaround at the school, because it's accountable to me. We have a, a, a maths and science uh, center. How did that come about? It was because every time uh, we, I went there, the, the children were doing maths, I mean, maths lead. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't know what that is. It's one, two oranges make five apples. I don't know what it is. Uh, you see, they're laughing. Because we abolished them. The parents were upset. Now you meet a losing child in the street. They said, I do pure maths. It's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. We have a science center, uh, and uh, if you Google, you can look. They are entering in national science competitions and winning some of them. So to me, this is a sacred moment because I'm declaring publicly the Dini way. I have had it and I will work for as much as I can, but I do not have the, the energy to wait because I see these papers all the time. And I think that uh, when <laughs> Unobuta called me in April, I was in Dubai, I don't know where she had an epiphany somewhere, says, Upi, Mrs. K, now, you know, this is what we're going to be doing. I said, no, I'm waiting to board a flight to California. I'm done. <laughs> and she said, no, but give us a chance. Ma'am, so I did, no, I'm on my way to California. I'll talk to you when I get back. Well, she kept her word. She's been at me all the time. And maybe, just maybe, because you're a woman, I might change my mind. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sugunene. Siabonga, siabonga kakulu. Si nyuve siwa zulu natal. We will keep our word, and our promise is a promise. Our commitment is the commitment. As I mentioned before, this is our decolonial project as the humanities. And our DVC is here, and there is not just commitment in word, as I'm saying, 
but it is in action. As he alluded in his uh, welcome um, this afternoon, we will be filling in a position, a research chair, in the name of Professor Mazesugunene at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And <laughs> coupled with that, coupled with that, Mrs. K, there will be bursaries for masters, PhD, and even postdoctoral students that will be funded um, through that work. And um, we look forward to uh, our ongoing relationship with the Mazesugunene Foundation and we'll continue our digitization project as part and parcel of, our, of building our human language technologies. That is the commitment um, that we have. And we would really like to have that uh, to continue uh, the relationship that Mazusugunene uh, Foundation has with Tluzungondo High School. So, um, at this time, may I now call upon my professor, my sister Dean, uh, Professor Matsepo Matwane, who is now going to give a voice, uh, a closing remarks and um, a, a close for us. Um, I know that like you want to rush and go now, but like she's not gonna take a long time. Please bear with us, allow Prof Matwane to give the closing remarks. Over to you Prof Matwane, thank you so much Prof. Sanibonani, and thank you so much, Program Director, Professor Nobutle Shangwa, our DVC, uh, Professor Ntlantlam Kize, um, our guest speaker, keynote speaker, Professor Mota Madigan, um, the Director for the Center of Creative Arts, um, Dr. Ishmael Mohammed. Um, Umama Kunene, greetings and thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm not going to take long. My, my task is very, very simple and very small. I'm supposed to thank um, everyone for this event. I think we can all agree this has been a very momentous uh, afternoon. Um, just being able to see the legacy of Professor Mazizi Kunene being preserved, and I think also being nurtured. Um, I, 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 I believe that, and, I, and I'm grateful that Prof. Longwa actually uh, embraced the challenge from Mama Kunene, um, and, and even showed us how that challenge is going to be carried forward uh, in, in, in making sure that we don't lose that legacy that we take this process forward. So allow me then to thank um, our DVC for opening for us and welcoming all of us to this occasion. Uh, thank you, Prof, for also setting the context and the scene for this afternoon's uh, event. Um, allow me also to give a special word of thanks to Dr. Ishmael Mohammed for all the work in um, organizing this event and making sure that we have this array and display of activities that we saw uh, this afternoon. This was an excellent display of the talent of Africa. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I want to also give a special word of appreciation to our performers, um, this afternoon, Mr. Sisanda Shozi, uh, Mr. Madala Kunene, Dr. Gainam Thope, Professor Tomohiro Kambayashi Ueda. Thank you so much um, for showing us the diversity of talent that we have in, in Africa, in South Africa. Um, we do appreciate um, the fact that you shared with us your, your, your bit of excellence and expertise in, in what you do. We appreciate having made this occasion um, even much more enjoyable. Um, I want to thank our Dr. Mazibuko for the work that she did as she introduced our guest speaker. Uh, 
um, and allow me to extend a very special appreciation for, to you, uh, Professor Zodo Amota Madikani, for allowing to come and give a keynote address and for unpacking uh, the, the, the philosophy of Professor Mazizi Kunene. Um, as I was watching the events unfold, I couldn't help think of the metaphor of an onion. But then I remembered what you said, that you thought about that metaphor because somehow there was that, that peeling of the layers. But you thought it was not a good representation. And you came with the issue, the metaphor of the Amarula tree. And I think it, it so uh, aptly you know, made that, that representation of what you shared with us uh, this afternoon. So thank you so much for, for unpacking and opening up to us the ideas and the philosophy around uh, what Professor Mazizi Gunene stood for. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Mrs. Gunene, on behalf of the Mazizi Gunene Foundation for, for sharing with us and being honest with us around how you feel about this entire process and the journey that you've been through and the commitment that you have made. Um, I, I, I want to believe that as you challenged us as an institution of higher learning, around the curriculum, the kind of curriculum that we offer. Um, and, and also, I think when we, we listen to the, to the presentation by our keynote speaker, the issue around decolonialization of our curriculum, what we teach. Um, and I think with these VVIPs that are sitting here, I think this was an opportunity to actually open up the debate, the dialogue around what is relevant for us and the fact that we do have um, people in our midst or we had people in our midst who had the opportunity to generate knowledge, to create knowledge. And so you, you, you challenged us to say, what are you doing with that knowledge? And I think our DVC is one person who's really driving the decoloniality agenda for us at the institution. So we've heard you, and thank you so much for the challenge and for being honest with us. Um, I want to also thank Corporate Communications for organizing this event and everyone else within that team. Uh, thank you so much for making all this possible. I know that we've got uh, people online as well joining us. Um, thank you for the technical team that made all that possible. We live in a very strange world these days. We've, we've got people joining us, but we can't see them. And so I just want to say thank you also to the audience for your patience, for being able to sit through and listen. This event wouldn't have been a success if you were not here as well. So thank you so much to the program director as well for a job well done in facilitating this event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Matana. And I will be able to give you a challenge. I will be able to give you you were a good audience this afternoon and this evening. Um, at this time around, let me thank you all very much and now invite you, um, will I, should I call it dinner? But like, it is eats. So there are eats outside Ugula, says your toller again, manji, Oguya, nga se tunjin. Ninga ham, binga tolanga, Sibonge gakulu, poetry Africa continues. Go and get your eats at 1900. Siabuela Konala. Kusasa Futi, Siabuela Konala. Sunday, Siabuela Konala, Sizovala. Guma different venues. Siabonga Kulu for supporting UKZN, for supporting Poetry Africa. Nihambega Ashley. Hamba Pepalami.